Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. I've been doing in organizing Saturday morning physics, particularly in the fall, is presenting the physics fact quizzes. And this is one of them from the fall, so I thought I'd let you revisit this. Um, the question is, what are neutrinos? Um, you might remember that one. A, along with protons, one of the components of the nucleus. B, the antiparticles of the electron. C, neutral subatomic particles emitted in radioactive decay. And D, small fruit flavored candies. This, this points out the difficulty, actually, of making up multiple choice exams. <clears throat> that you have to find wrong answers as well. At any rate, how many think it's uh, A, B, C, or D? I guess we're telling you the answer is uh, C. <laughs> Time perfectly. All right, they're neutral subatomic particles emitted in radioactive decay. And they were initially postulated, actually, um, long before they were ever directly observed. In fact, uh, by the 1920s, the examination of radioactivity showed, uh, in particular by Becquerel, Curie, uh, Pierre Curie, and Marie Curie, that uh, a source of something like radium, which is a naturally occurring radioactive <coughs> mineral, uh, ore, would produce radioactivity that could be separated in a magnetic field. In fact, if the magnetic field's into the page, the one that went to the left they called alpha, the one that went straight up, essentially undeflected, gamma, and the one that went to the right was called uh, beta. And uh, the betas we now know are electrons that are emitted when a nucleus changes its charge. For example, carbon-14, very important in uh, radioactive dating, as you know, uh, decays into nitrogen-14. Carbon has uh, six protons and the nitrogen has seven. And so to conserve electric charge, uh, this particle, the electron, that we now know as the electron, must be emitted as well. Moreover, conservation of momentum, which physicists and everyone should believe in uh, very deeply and not give up uh, unless the evidence is absolutely compelling that this is not the case, um, says that if there were the, just these two particles to which the carbon-14 decays, that the momentum of the recoil nucleus, the nitrogen-14, would have to be equal to the momentum of the electron. And one can do a little bit of um, algebra to show, therefore, that you can predict precisely, in this case, what the momentum of the electron is. It's fixed by the amount of energy that is um, emitted, which we call Q, the amount of energy that's available. That energy, incidentally, is available because the mass of the carbon-14 nucleus is a little bit more than that of the electron plus the nitrogen-14, and the mass is converted to energy through the well-known formula E equals mc squared. And so a measurement should show a very precise single uh, value of the momentum of the electron. But in fact, experiments by the late 1920s showed that there's a, a, a spread, a continuum uh, that was measured. And if this is true, momentum conservation and energy conservation together would have to be wrong. And uh, unwilling to give that up, uh, physicists indeed were, and Wolfgang Pauli, in an address to the group on radioactivity in Tübingen, um, Thursday evening lectures, I believe, <laughs> gave, hypothesized a particle, excuse me, hypothesized a particle that he uh, did not give a name to initially, it's certainly not the name by which we know it now, um, an undetectable particle which rescued momentum and energy conservation, but in some sense produced an interesting new conundrum. But it just had to be, or energy and momentum conservation would not be consistent with the observations. And in fact, Enrico Fermi worked out a detailed theory uh, uh, with some restrictions of the process of radioactive decay. And in so doing, uh, an Italian named this the little neutral one, or the neutrino. And that's how it was born in this uh, postulate. Now, um, neutrinos 
are involved in a lot of different kinds of interactions. So the example that I gave you now has to be rewritten uh, in the way that uh, Fermi would have written it down using Pauli's postulate. This is called beta decay, the emission of a beta carbon-14. Um, there's another beta decay, which is oxygen-14 also going to nitrogen-14. The difference is that nitrogen-14 has one fewer protons than oxygen-14. And so to conserve charge, there must be a positive electron, the antiparticle of the electron, which we now call the positron. And in fact, I draw this diagram to get you accustomed to the idea that mc squared is something that we can graph the energy associated with the mass. I told you that the mass of carbon-14 is a little bit greater than that of nitrogen-14. And the graph of oxygen-14 is a little bit greater than that of nitrogen-14. In fact, more so than the carbon-14 is. There are other interactions that involve neutrinos. One of them is called electron capture, where an atomic electron uh, close to the nucleus, for example, in a heavy material like lead, is actually grabbed or captured by the nucleus. Uh, and lead turns into thallium, and neutrinos involved in that. Neutrinos can be captured if they're incident um, on protons, for instance, <clears throat> in water, for example. The proton can be converted to the neut uh, neutron. And again, because the proton is converted to a neutron, a positive charge, the positive electron or positron is emitted. Neutrinos can be absor uh, absorbed or captured by other things. Chlorine-37 is one that will be important today. So I note that in this example, a negative electron is produced. Later on, particularly in the study of cosmic rays, uh, in experiments where detectors eventually and uh, film-like emulsions were flown up in balloons to high altitudes, uh, particles were discovered, and later in accelerators, such as the pi meson, which decays. It comes in both positive and negative forms, decays to positive or negative electrons. There's a neutrino involved in that. Um, the particle called the muon, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, decays, actually producing two neutrinos. And neutrinos actually can scatter. For instance, a neutrino can come into material and hit an atomic electron and cause that atomic electron to. Um, gain some of the energy that the initial neutrino had and momentum. Uh, and this can also happen with protons. So neutrinos can do a lot of things, which is good news because uh, they were postulated by Pauli, named by Fermi. But Pauli was quite concerned. He felt it was really a bad thing to introduce a particle that couldn't be detected or something that really couldn't be confirmed. This array of interactions at least gives us some idea that uh, they may be seen directly. And uh, that's indeed what happened, but it took quite a long time. Um, this is um, uh, Fred Reines here. And uh, he, along with Clyde Cowan, were excited and interested in the idea of, of detecting neutrinos, free neutrinos, as they called them. In fact, the difficulty in detecting neutrinos had led people to suggest that maybe they couldn't get out of the nuclear system. They couldn't become free. And so they called this these free neutrinos they were trying to detect. Now, they needed a source of neutrinos. And one of the reasons, the main reason that neutrinos are so hard to detect, though not entirely undetectable, is that their interactions are very weak. For example, if one had um, many liters, 200 liters of w basically water, about five meters uh, I I along one direction or several meters along one direction, and uh, a lot of neutrinos, for example, in a nuclear explosion over a very short period of time, a lot of neutrinos are released. Um, and uh, if there are about 10 to the 14th of those, none would be detected on average. In fact, only one in about 10 to the 18 is detected um, in an experiment like this. And so you'd have to have, well, 10 to the fourth nuclear explosions, which isn't really very practical. And so they realized. <laughs> that a nuclear reactor would be a better source. It's continuous, and that's producing about 10 to the 14th per second. And so in a few hours, perhaps, you could get one neutrino interaction in a big tank of water, as long as you could somehow detect it. And what um, Rhinus and Cowan did was uh, used one of the neutrino interactions I mentioned, a neutrino being absorbed by a proton, producing a neutron. Neutrons are pretty easy to detect, particularly if you put a little cadmium in here. 
And uh, this is a positron, and that's the antiparticle of the electron, which is oh so easy to detect because it can, in the water, very easily find a negative electron, annihilate, and produce a very characteristic radiation, which is actually a pair of gamma rays of a very characteristic energy. So uh, they did this. Now, this experiment was uh, deep underground, and all neutrino experiments are. And in order to understand um, why that is, I want to uh, show you what happens here at sea level when we try to detect very rare events involving nuclear particles. This is a cloud chamber. Um, it's uh, it's in encased here a little bit for shadow purposes. And um, the way this works is that there's a vapor in here um, above a liquid, which is very volatile, alcohol, for example. And, uh, and it's cooled. So the vapor is is super saturated. It's just sitting there waiting to condense uh, back into the liquid form. But the condensation is most easily affected uh, around when, when there's nucleation around some kind of change in there. And one of the main ways to change it is by producing ions, by tearing the electrons away from the atoms. And that can be done as high energy nuclear particles, uh, electrons, nuclei, or even cosmic ray muons, cosmic ray particles, pass through this. So what you can see here is that occasionally, certainly much more, you know, on the order of about once a second, there is a track through here. The camera is looking at a slight angle, so these tracks that are very straight are cosmic ray muons. And these provide a significant background in a neutrino experiment and would make it impossible to detect events that happen once an hour. We, uh, contemplated exactly how to show everything we wanted to show. So we, we have some lead bricks here. We, we have just about two inches of lead here. And you can see that we really haven't changed things much. And if you did a detailed study, uh, it would be very hard to detect that there's any shielding here. So these experiments go deep underground, miles underground in some cases. This experiment of Rhinus and Cowan was actually done uh, underground. It was initially done uh, at the Hanford reactor in Washington, involved in production of, uh, of tritium and nuclear weapons material, and then moved to the Savannah River reactor where they actually did succeed in showing in the early 1960s that uh, neutrinos really did come from these decays and, and that they were detectable. Okay, well, a lot has happened, uh, and the important conclusions are here, that there apparently are six kinds of neutrino. That's what I grew up believing. Um, in fact, we still believe that, but the six kinds of neutrino are not the same as what we learned about. So one point is that when carbon-14 decays, there's a negative electron, and nitrogen-14 decays, and there's a positive electron. And we realize that this neutrino is in some way different from that. The neutrino associated with the making matter, the electron, is different than the neutrino associated with making antimatter, the positron. In fact, in this reaction, we named this one the antineutrino, and so we put a bar over it to call it the antineutrino. And that comes with the electron, and the neutrino comes with the positron in this kind of reaction. If we move the neutrino over to the other side in the neutrino capture type of reactions, we change an antineutrino to a neutrino or a neutrino to an antineutrino. But this turns out to be one of the reasons that neutrinos were not detected earlier, because the detectors were set up to um, detect antineutrinos. <clears throat> and uh, if they were set up to detect neutrinos, reactors produce antineutrinos. And so Cowan and Rhinus succeeded because they made a detector that could detect antineutrinos. So there's at least these two, a neutrino and an antineutrino, that go with the electron and the antielectron. But then the cosmic ray interactions and accelerator production of pi mesons and muons, and the neutrinos associated with them turned out to be distinct from the neutrinos produced with electrons and positrons. Uh, they don't interact with protons. And so there's a special uh, separate kind of, muon, uh, of neutrino that seems to come when the muon is produced. The muon is in ways distinct from the electron. In fact, that was kind of a a puzzle uh, for quite a long time. Muons 
are a lot like electrons from a physicist's point of view. They're point-like particles. Many of their properties that are related to their charge and mass can be predicted very precisely for the electron completely in parallel with the muon. And it was a mystery uh, when it was first discovered why nature needed this particle. The modern view of particle physics is, is much broader and uh, we feel that it makes a lot more sense now. But um, when the muon was discovered, uh, actually Robbie, I, I Robbie, uh, asked the question, who ordered that? Because it just didn't seem to fit into any of our understanding of particle physics at the time. Then uh, Marty Pearl, who was a professor here at Michigan uh, in around 1960, in this period, uh, discovered yet another muon-like thing to go with the electron and the muon, namely the tau. And nobody asked who ordered that. They just congratulated Marty for his wonderful discovery. <laughs> <coughs> and actually, he shared the 1995 Nobel Prize with Fred Reines, who discovered uh, directly neutrinos. By then, Clyde Cowan had died. And as you may know, Nobel Prizes are not um, awarded to uh, deceased, the deceased. So um, in fact, associated with the tau is yet another neutrino. And these are the six kinds of neutrinos. There's an electron neutrino, antineutrino, muon neutrino, antineutrino and a tau neutrino antineutrino. The other thing that I learned growing up studying subatomic physics was that neutrino flavors don't mix. Okay, so we call these flavors. Electron is a flavor, muon is a flavor, and tau is a flavor. Hence the question about small fruit flavored candies. The electron neutrino does not seem to interact or get together with a muon type of neutrino and, or with muons and the tau similarly, and antineutrinos don't mix with either each other or with the other flavors of neutrino. Except through an interaction that was uh, really discovered in the 1970s, which are called neutral currents. So there is a class of neutrino interaction that is interesting. For instance, a muon neutrino could break up a heavy hydrogen, a deuteron which is made up of a proton and neutron. So if the neutrino has enough energy, about 2 MeV, it can break up a deuteron, producing a free neutron, which is detectable. And uh, the neutrino, however, uh, just sort of passes through, losing some energy and transferring some momentum. So that's called breakup. So let's uh, summarize here. The neutrinos are produced in these weak interactions, such as ones where protons change into neutrons. They hardly interact at all. And thus, they're very, very hard to detect. And you have to go deep underground. Um, neutrino interactions conserve flavor. That was the wisdom. And uh, the neutrinos have a very small mass because their effects in all of these decays on the energy and momentum conservation are really beyond the level of precision of any experiment, though people have tried hard to directly measure the mass of the neutrino. So it's at least very small. Why not zero if it's so small? So presentation of neutrinos in all the textbooks that I studied, therefore, um, had massless neutrinos that conserved flavor and um, had been detected. And one of the main sources of neutrinos that people sought to detect them from was the sun itself. It has about 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms of mass um, and a radius of 7 times 10 to the 8th meters. At the surface, its temperature is about 6,500 degrees Kelvin, which is almost the same as 6,500 degrees uh, centigrade, or 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit. But at the core, its temperature is much, much higher. The energy uh, that produces this much, much higher temperature, of course, uh, even from the time, the 20s and earlier, Eddington, for example, suggested that this was and must have been due to a nuclear energy source just because of the energy scales involved. A nuclear energy source per interaction produces about an MeV, almost a million times more than a typical chemical energy interaction. Um, and we now know that this uh, must be provided by hydrogen fusion. The luminosity, the total power produced by the sun, is uh, 4 times 10 to the 26th watts. And that spreads out into all space at the surface of the Earth, the, po the position of the Earth, it spreads out over a sphere that has a radius of one astronomical unit. And that's just perfect for us, as we know. It's 
sustains life here on Earth. This is the fusion reaction in summary. There's a lot more detail I'll discuss in a moment, but basically four hydrogens, positively charged protons in essence, the nuclei, uh, repelling each other electrostatically as they get closer and closer together because the force goes like one over r squared. Nevertheless, they're coming at each other with sufficient speed because of the high temperature that they get close enough that the electrostatic interaction is overcome essentially when they're touching within 10 to the minus 15 meters of each other, they combine and actually form deuterium. But four of those come together and ultimately a helium is made, two neutrinos and two positive electrons. So this must involve a weak interaction. Um, the neutrino luminosity, one can calculate from the numbers that are shown here, the homework problem, is 1.8 times 10 to the 38th neutrinos per second. It's huge. And uh, as you can see, that's a, almost a trillion neutrinos per joule of energy that we get from the sun. And at the Earth, there are 6 times 10 to the 14th meters per second. That's about, it turns out to be about a, per meter squared per second, about 100 times less than the reactor flux that Rhinus uh, detected. So his detector could have seen about one one hundredth of a neutrino in every hour or a hundred hours, four days per neutrino. Now we understand the sun extremely well. Um, it's uh, spherical. There's a standard solar model that describes it as spherical because of the gravity uh, and hydrostatic equilibrium. The temperature presses, pushes outward just as an expanding gas and gravity pulls inward. Um, in fact, you could write an equation here. Stellar evolution is a fairly uh, de well-developed field, and the ideas of stellar evolution applied to the sun um, and the idea of, of ideas of dating that it's 4.6 billion years old and making the assumption that what's now at the surface is the same thing that the sun was made of when it started 4.6 billion years ago. At the core of the sun, the some of the hydrogen has changed into helium. But out at the surface, um, that tells us what's going on. And also that the luminosity that we measure now tells us what's going on at the core of the sun right now. Now that's a very, very uh, interesting assumption because the sun's core, we can't see it. It's very opaque. In fact, it's, it's a glowing core, so it's incandescent at very high temperature, millions of degrees. 15, millions of, of de 15 million degrees. And so the light or photons that are produced near the core of the sun actually don't go very far before they interact. And so they make this sort of random walk out. It turns out that the photons essentially rapidly come into thermal equilibrium with wherever they are as they move out. And it takes thousands, tens of thousands of years uh, for them to get out uh, from the center of the sun. Convection plays a role in this as well, that there are cells of matter moving around in the sun, of course, um, as well. So it, but it nevertheless takes tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 years for us to learn about what's going on at the core of the sun. The neutrinos take two seconds to get to the surface of the sun, essentially unimpeded. A few of them um, are absorbed. And, uh, so they can tell us directly what's happening at the core of the sun, at least eight minutes ago, which is how long it takes the neutrinos to get from the center of the sun, from the surface of the sun uh, to a detector on Earth. So the idea of looking at the neutrinos is one uh, from the sun is one of really looking today at what's happening. Okay, so this uh, is a more detailed picture of what happens when, uh, how this series of reactions happen in the core of the sun that have hydrogen turning into helium. And so I just want to point out a couple of complicated things, uh, issues here on this complicated graph. So hydrogen is going into helium. But actually, um, there are different what we call branches. 99.75% of the time, we believe that two hydrogens come together and make um, a deuterium. But uh, a quarter of a percent of the time, we think an, a negative electron is captured by hydrogen and making deuterium. Both these involve neutrinos. neutrinos are involved in weak interactions. This is actually the rate limiting uh, step here, this very first step. It determines the rate at which hydrogen is turning into helium in the core of the sun. And therefore, it really determines the rate at which energy is being emitted from the sun, the solar luminosity. 
hydrogen combines with uh, deuterium to make helium-3. And then a couple of helium-3s come together to make helium-4. That happens 86% of the time. Or 14% of the time, the helium-3 can find another helium-4 there. There was a little helium-4 to begin with, and there's more now. Making a beryllium-7 and a gamma ray. And uh, the beryllium-7 can capture 2 one hundredths of a percent of the time a hydrogen to make a boron-8. Boron-8 decays in an interaction involving a positron and a neutrino. And these are not antineutrinos. These are neutrinos in every step because they're involved with positrons producing uh, helium-4. There's also some uh, contribution due to what's called the CNO cycle that was elucidated by Hans Bethe, uh, who died about a month ago. Uh, but this is quite complicated, as you can see, but very well understood. Every aspect of this, the arrows that represent how the probability of these happening uh, are well measured, and so on. Um, and so there's actually a spectrum of neutrinos from the sun. Some of them coming, for example, most of them. This is a logarithmic plot, so this is a factor of a trillion here. Each one of these is a factor of 10. By far, the most neutrinos come from two protons coming together. But this is the neutrino energy. Those neutrinos have very low energy. There are some lines of neutrinos here from some of these interactions. And then there are continua here. In particular, the important one is the very last step that I showed you, what we call the boron-8 neutrinos coming from that interaction. There are a lot of possible detectors to see this neutrino. And one of them I wrote down for you before is the neutrino plus a chlorine-37 nucleus can make argon-37 plus uh, a negative electron. And uh, this was pointed out by Alvarez Pontecorvo and then Ray Davis and John Bacall uh, in the late 50s and 60s um, really looked in, a, in detail at the possibility of doing this and decided actually it might be possible. Because chlorine-37 is 24% of natural chlorine. Because the chlorine-37 um, is more massive than argon, uh, less massive than argon-37, you have to add some energy to make this go, and that energy is about a little less than an MeV. So there's a threshold for this here. So the neutrinos with energy greater than this threshold could be measured in this way. Of course, it has to be deep underground. 1,500 meters was accessible at a gold mine in, gold mine in South Dakota. And um, all you needed to do was, uh, for about a month, which is the half-life of the argon-37, let the detector sit there and uh, expect a few argon atoms and then uh, remove them and count them. So they had uh, actually 600 tons of, this is essentially cleaning fluid. So it wasn't very expensive. You could buy a lot of it. And uh, every six days, they expected one atom. Every month, they went and looked for about five, therefore. And uh, the person who did this was a brilliant uh, radiological chemist, radio chemist named Ray Davis. And this is this tank deep underground. There he is. This is uh, him somewhat later. They had to wear hard hats in this mine. Uh, and, um, and so in this tank was essentially a lot of this cleaning fluid. And this is what they looked for. OK, now to get and detect the argon um, atoms, they had to extract them from the chlorine, five argon atoms, for example, in a month. And they did that by bubbling lots and lots of helium through. And as the helium bubbles through, if there is an argon atom to be found, uh, it, it would get caught in a helium bubble, and then it would come out. And really, it works. Um, because once the argon was there, it, it, they could detect it with very, very high efficiency. So if they could collect the argon atoms, they could detect that they had made them. This is a heroic effort, you have to realize. And there were only about four or five physicists involved uh, at the time. And uh, when I heard about it, I think I was an undergraduate the first time, and it just, uh, it just astounded me that anyone would go after something like this. It sounds impossible, doesn't it? Five, five atoms of argon collected from 610 tons of cleaning fluid. Well, it's a guy like Ray Davis who would say impossible is nothing and go ahead and do it. And they did. The ex expectation, this is um, the number of atoms per day. And uh, the, uh, that were actually expected in, in this experiment. So I drew a line there. 
John Bacall invented a unit called the solar neutrino unit, SNU, which is a certain number of, our, of atoms produced or neutrino interactions per 10 to the 36th target atoms per day. Kind of a strange unit, but a useful one because the answer is always on the order of one. And so that was the expectation. Cosmic ray level deep underground at 1,500 meters is shown here, and the data are shown here. Uh, up to 1976, three years actually here is what they saw and this is what was expected based on the standard solar model and all the understanding of neutrinos. Um, so that doesn't quite agree and uh, that led to calling this, the, this is by the way the most updated um, chlorine result, the solar neutrino problem. Now calling it a problem was a physicist's way because physicists love problems. This is just what we live for that we want to solve them, we want to make the measurements, we want to do whatever it takes, it's exciting. Um, like a war to a journalist, perhaps. So problem is a good name, uh, but perhaps an unfortunate name, and so uh, a lot of the proponents have tried to rename this uh, the solar neutrino puzzle. What could be going on? Well, the first possibility is that Ray Davis is wrong, of course. But this experiment was extensively calibrated in lots of ways. He showed that with about 95% efficiency, he could put in a few argon atoms, maybe 100, and get them out. Uh, if you bubble the helium for 24 hours, puts a different form of chlorine in to show that the argon actually isn't trapped somewhere in there, that the helium really would get it out, even if it's produced in a nuclear decay, which imparts some energy to the argon. He actually put argon 37 atoms in and got them out. Um, and uh, then there was a strong neutron source that was uh, used to produce argon-30. Anyway, it was really well calibrated. And even though uh, there was a lot of skepticism about his results, Ray Davis just stood beside them and said, uh, I really believe them. This is what I've done. He presented everything and let the rest of the world conclude. Um, but uh, he was a brilliant experimentalist. Another possibility is that neutrino physics is wrong perhaps in the detector, that the neutrino interactions with chlorine are not well understood. But they are very well studied, and that is not to believe to be the problem. The problem is, in fact, that there's no direct calibration. There's no real neutrino source other than the sun available to do this. Um, or perhaps the neutrino uh, physics in the sun that produced this spectrum calculated by John Bacall uh, and consistently updated. Uh, maybe that was wrong. There's something about the energy production or the neutrino production in the core of the sun. Perhaps, therefore, some of these arrows are not well understood. In fact, it's the boron-8 neutrinos, so this is the direct way to the boron-8 neutrinos, which is the most complicated of all processes that uh, led to some confusion. And then every few years, there were just piles of papers, and uh, this one, in fact, uh, has my name on it. Um, and uh, this addresses directly the possibility that one, some of the neutrino physics is wrong, but in fact the solar neutrino problem just plain persisted. Is the standard solar model incorrect? Well, John Bacall has made a career out of doing, putting this all together with the standard solar model and making these calculations. Um, there's an extremely strong temperature dependence, the temperature to the 13th power in the production of boron-8 neutrinos. So if the temperature are off by some small fraction, nevertheless, tens of thousands of degrees, um, that, that could explain it. But that's just too big a temperature error at the center of the sun to explain the current sun in equilibrium um, as we understand it. In equilibrium is key. Maybe the sun is changing rather rapidly. It takes 10,000 years for us to learn that the sun may be cooling at the core of its center, tens of thousands of years. So perhaps the neutrinos are telling us what's gonna, what we're going to experience 10,000 years from now, a lot, much cooler sun by a factor of about three. Uh, that could be a concern to some. Uh, 10,000 years is probably too long a period for us to think that we can stop worrying about social security problems. <clears throat> but nevertheless, um, that is a possibility, but more recently, the actual seismology of the sun has emerged and can measure, for example, the density of the sun, looking at the modes of oscillation. The sun has many modes of oscillation, and these have been studied with great precision. And you can see here uh, a red line 
that actually shows a calculation uh, of the, and the difference of Bacall's model, standard solar model, and the uh, understanding that comes from solar oscillations. It would have to be way down here compared to the variations uh, to explain and solve the solar neutrino puzzle. So Davis and Bacall had stood by their results for a long time in the face of great uh, skepticism. But nevertheless, experimenters have to step in and say, the boron-8 neutrinos could still have uncertainties we haven't thought of. They certainly have a 16% error here. If only we could measure the lower energy part of the spectrum where there are a million times more neutrinos. And that's one thing that people set out to do. And therefore, a, an experiment that's similar in a way to the chlorine experiment but used gallium has a much lower threshold. So a couple of people set out to do, uh, groups set out to do this. Gallium is extremely expensive. In fact, there were two experiments. It's a strategic material uh, because of the uh, uh, weapons implications of it, which I won't go into. The, um, but it uh, costs uh, thousands of dollars per kilogram. And so to make a large quantity of gallium, uh, in fact, it had to be borrowed. And the Soviet Union had a lot of it. Uh, and um, so a collaboration of uh, the Soviet Union then at the time, and America, you can tell that this started before 1991, called SAGE, made a measurement. And then another group in Europe, deep underground in Italy, near Rome in the Grand Sasso Tunnel, called the Galax, uh, did their measurements. And here is the expectation of the standard solar model, and here is the result. And the discrepancy persists even for much lower energy neutrinos. In fact, this is about uh, one half to two thirds of the standard solar model. So it's a little bit more than that. Another class of detector is called the Cherenkov detector. This is pretty cool. Cherenkov radiation is produced in a way that's very similar to what happens when a bullet goes through the air supersonically. It produces a, a shock wave that propagates backwards from the, the bullet like this, because the sound can't propagate as fast as the bullet's moving. A boat in the water, uh, it can easily go faster than the speed of waves on the surface of the water. And an electron that's moving through a material like water can easily be going close to the speed of light, but in a material, the speed of light is significantly less. Uh, in water, it's about uh, three-fourths the speed of light in a vacuum. And if that happens, the bow wave is produced. And uh, from each point here, the waves propagate outwards. This, if the electron is here, then uh, this is the most recent wave propagating outward. This is a little earlier one, a little earlier, a little earlier, a little earlier, and so on. And if you have an array of detectors here that can actually detect the light that's produced, then there's a, a ring. If you take and rotate this around like this, there's an actual ring of what we call hits on the detector. And uh, if you look at one period in time, you'd see a ring. And that's the principle of these Cherenkov detectors. The very first one of these was actually um, strongly dependent on Michigan physicists. It was called the Irvine-Michigan-Brookhaven collaboration. And um, there's a marvelous set of pictures that come from these things, because um, this is uh, a tank of water, very, very pure water, so it's very transparent. And to do the physics, you have to uh, uh, be a diver, in part. So those of you who like diving and think physics is cool might consider a career in, in this. These here, are all arrayed around here, are photo detectors. I have an example here of one. It's very fragile, too, so I'll be careful with it. To give you an idea, the light hits the front face, and um, then there's uh, an electronic signal, in essence, that comes out the back. And these plastic things here are to help collect the light a little bit more. If the light hits this plastic, it can get transferred to this tube as well. Because the bigger these tubes get, the more expensive they get, um, at least in proportion to their area, if not their volume. Uh, and so an experiment like this, it really raises the scale of such an experiment. But note there's still basically about a dozen people involved in this. Now, this experiment actually was not designed initially to uh, look for uh, solar neutrinos. It was designed to see if the proton itself is a stable object. And in particular, it wanted to see if a proton would decay into a pi meson and an electron. In 1987, for a, an instant, there was a source of neutrinos, for about 10 seconds actually, that was much greater than the sun. And that was the supernova uh, 1987A, a real gift to astronomy and science. 
Um, so here is a picture before and after uh, of the same field in the sky to give you an idea of the, how much it lit up a portion of the sky, but it also lit up the neutrino detectors. In fact, in the course of 10 seconds, this uh, detector that maybe would detect one cosmic neutrino per week saw in 10 seconds it saw eight events. Now those neutrinos traveled 170,000 light years and this turned out to be extremely important for neutrino physics because if the neutrinos had mass, remember I said that we believed or were taught that neutrinos were massless, neutrinos had a little bit of mass, they couldn't travel at the speed of light. And so the light and the neutrinos w might lag each other a little bit. Or in fact, neutrinos of different energies would have slightly different velocities. And since they travel such a long distance, they could spread out in time. Now, unfortunately, these, this detector and the other detector that saw these neutrinos from the supernova 1987A were not set up to do the timing precisely enough to tell us enough about neutrinos, but it was an extremely exciting time. And they did manage to set a limit on the mass of the uh, neutrinos that were produced in the supernova. These detectors can detect these neutrinos and they have a threshold that depends on the kind of neutrino and uh, the neutrino energy and this really is just a technical aspect of the detector in, in most cases. But they can, these are also can be used for neutrino detection and this one, this is uh, for the canoeists I guess, um, they're just filling this detector with water and this is Kamiokande, it's in Japan and uh, it was uh, super, uh, superseded after it came something called Super K. And um, these are all the photo tubes here, and they're filling it with water. So you get wonderful pictures. And uh, the, they actually did look at the solar neutrinos. And you can see here that um, the expectation and the data just don't line up. It's, again, about half the number of solar neutrinos expected are seen. One last. Uh, piece of data comes from the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. And this is uh, not far from here. It's in Ontario. It's in a lead mine. This is a picture from the bottom, up from the bottom show, uh, on the outside showing the uh, photo tubes here. And this experiment had the wonderful feature that they could look at not just the electron neutrinos, but all the neutrinos. They are sensitive also to muon neutrinos as well as any other kind of neutrino through the process called neutral currents, and that really works. Super Kamiokande and the results from this snow detector uh, can look at different kinds of neutrino interactions, the ones that are only sensitive to the electron neutrino, and that's along the horizontal axis, and then the ones that are sensitive to any kind of neutrino, muon or even the tau neutrino here. The electron neutrinos from the sun are in deficit, but the total number of neutrinos works just perfectly, meets the standard solar model. So that tells us that, in fact, the answer to the solar neutrino puzzle is that it's the neutrinos. What's happening? Well, in the sun, it's electron neutrinos that are produced. But at the Earth, only half of those are detected. Somewhere in between, something happens. To explain to you what happens, which is called uh, neutrino oscillations, first predicted by Bruno Pontecorvo and discussed by him, I have to uh, spend the rest of my time telling you about the quantum mechanics of neutrinos. Quantum mechanics, of course, the core theory of uh, modern physics, subatomic physics and atomic physics. And um, there are a few things that I'll, I'll remind you of. One of them is uh, that quantum systems have discrete states or quantum levels, that transitions are in some way quantized. Now, there are many physicists who have a, a very deep understanding of quantum mechanics, but that deep understanding comes from a basic system that we use as a model system. And it's not the chlorine atom or the sodium atom or the deuterium nucleus. It's a very generic. It's the two-state system. That's what we call it. So uh, I'll give you some examples, though, of a two-state system. Uh, one of them is uh, just the atom itself. Right? Well, that's not really a two-state system. It's a many-state system, but we are so wed to the intuition that we gain and keep from the two-state system that we even try to turn a very complicated system with many levels, like an atom, into a two-state system. In fact, it's only two states that are involved in the atomic physics of this laser pointer being able to produce red 
and this laser pointer being able to produce green light. Just two states. So even though it's a complicated material in here with many levels and many transitions, a laser is an example of how two states can be uh, most important. And in nuclei, gamma rays uh, are emitted when uh, a nucleus decays from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. NMR is based on the two-state system of spins, actually proton spins, spin up and spin down. And uh, we even think of a system like the neutron and proton, nuclear particles that have very similar masses as a two-state system, believe it or not, that have a small difference in their mass and therefore a small difference in energy levels given by the mass difference times c squared, E equals mc squared. And now we're going to consider the two-state system of neutrinos. So let me call one neutrino one and one neutrino two, thing one and thing two. And um, remember that the, actually I, I, I do want to show you this uh, demonstration here, which is going to do a little bit to convince you um, about one important feature of quantum mechanics beyond the two states, namely that in addition to energy levels, quantum mechanics wants to treat particles such as atoms, neutrinos, electrons, and so on as waves, that we have this treatment. And so actually, uh, my first experiment is uh, just shining a laser, a green laser here, onto this uh, plate. That green laser is passing through some powder that's dispersed on a little plate here. And each particle of the powder, which is called lycopodium powder, is very small and it shadows the light. Around the edge of every piece of uh, this powder, the light, there's a source of light, the light diffracts out, and since the laser beam is very small, all of the pieces of powder diffract the light at about the same angles in such a way that there are light patterns and dark patterns. So this is called diffraction, and I'm, this is light. It's a wave property of light. I can also show you another experiment which shows a similar pattern. This is done with electrons. This is a beam of electrons. Is the magnet? Yes. OK. And in fact, to show you that it's a beam of electrons, I'm going to sort of just deflect it around with a magnet. OK. And uh, the other thing I can do with this that I can't do with the light is, in fact, change the energy of the electrons, which changes the size of the rings, which indicates that I'm changing the wavelength of the electrons. So these electrons are negatively charged, I can deflect them with a magnet, have wave-like properties, and um, e I can even tune the wavelength of that. This is, a, t from my perspective, a marvelous demonstration of the wave nature of particles. Just like light, it's a duality that also lies at the core of our understanding of quantum mechanics. The wave nature of the two-state system here uh, that I show and in fact, the wavelength of the higher energy state would be shorter, goes like 1 over the energy, uh, than the wavelength of the lower energy state. Now, if you can imagine that the electron neutrino emitted in the sun in a fusion reaction is actually a mixture of these okay, with slightly different frequencies. If you can't imagine that, just listen to this. Let's see if this helps you imagine it. Can you hear this? That's a frequency and a wavelength. You hear that too? OK. It's about the same, but it's actually slightly different. Let me do the two together, OK? So that what you hear is a mixture. And if you hear something that you're detecting, let's say, in analogy, the electron neutrino, OK? Okay, it comes and goes, two different frequencies. So if the electron neutrino is actually a mixture, and our detectors only detect the electron neutrino, just like your ear only detects when the sound's pushing, sound waves pushing on it, then this mixture um, is also described by an oscillation in the same way. And the oscillation frequency is given by this. It depends on the neutrino energy, but on the difference in mass of these two neutrinos. So the neutrinos would have to have a mass, at least one of them, so that there's a difference in mass. 
and, um, and then it would oscillate back and forth. At the sun, it's an electron neutrino, but it went against the earth, the probability of being an electron neutrino is less than one. This is the crux of neutrino oscillations. It could be reduced to a two-state system. These model systems, the systems that give us all the intuition um, that we hold on to, it, that the one two-state system and another two-state system and another two-state system, you only need to know one of them. Pick your favorite. Richard Feynman's favorite was the two-slit experiment. He wrote a wonderful series of textbooks and uses this many times, and he uses this to explain quantum mechanics. And my PhD thesis advisor took physics from Richard Feynman, so he impressed that on me. I thought I'd do it. Here's Feynman. Actually, you see he's actually lecturing on neutrinos here. This is a little bit uh, complicated. So back here behind this, there is a, a transmitter of microwaves. Those of you who were here last week, we used this. Uh, demonstration for actually a completely different purpose, but again, the crux of physics is that one system is just like another. The two slits here are formed by metal plates with a, 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 a plate that's blocking in between them. And I have a detector. And the detector right now, for, so far for my entire lecture, has been set at a special place here. But I'll set it back at the middle. And you see this detector uh, tells you that it's receiving microwave intensity or microwave power um, just by, well, making noise. And if I move this away, see, I can go from a maximum intensity, just like your ear was detecting a maximum intensity of sound, to a minimum, and then back to a maximum. What's happening is the waves, which are electromagnetic waves, are going through the two slits. And right at the center, where there's a maximum, um, those two waves are together. So the amplitudes for those add, and we can detect it. We can detect E1 plus E2. Where they destructively interfere, the first one was here, and there's another one there. Where they destructively interfere, then I have E1 minus E2, and they cancel each other, and you detect nothing, because that's what your detector uh, measures. All right. There and there. So the center part is like the sun, E1 plus E2. That's like the, the combination that's the electron neutrino. And over here, the probability of the electron neutrino is 0. And there's some other neutrino that if we could detect it, we would. In fact, that's what the SNOW experiment detected. Um, and then over at the Earth here, uh, it's something that's not 0 and not all electron neutrinos. There's one more piece that explains the whole situation. And that's what's called matter-enhanced oscillations, or the uh, MSW effect from Mikheyev, Smirnov, and Wolfenstein. I'm going to use the two-slit example to show you. So there's Professor Feynman looking on, approving of us doing so. What's different now is that as the neutrinos go through the sun, well, they're not absorbed, but their wavelength is affected. Now, we're not unaccustomed to that at all. Um, we've seen that effect almost every day. And uh, that, for light waves, is what we call refraction. The bending of light, for example, that uh, I'll demonstrate here, is a laser shining through this uh, vessel here. And it's basically going straight through. There's a little bit of plastic in the way, but pay no attention <clears throat> to the plastic. I'm now going to. Uh, put water in here. And in water, the wavelength of the light is different. And what happens to our spot? You can see that it's just jumped up to the top. All right? It's done so because the light as it's passing through, its wavelength changes in this material because the speed of propagation changes. The wavelength changes. Consequently, the path of the light changes. And that's very much what happens to neutrinos. The light's not absorbed very much, but the wavelength changes, hence the jump in the beam. And so if the wavelength changes as the neutrinos interact with the very dense matter of the sun, these uh, neutrino interactions can be greatly enhanced. And in fact, I can show that with my two-slit experiment by taking a phase shifter, which is just a piece of plastic, and putting it in front of one of the slits. And you can see that it makes a huge difference 
in going from a null to that. Um, and so we can very much affect the nature of neutrino oscillations. And detailed calculations show that they're affected um, in a rather complicated way. But nevertheless, with some assumptions, uh, it can be predicted. So there's a whole bunch of different, very specific models here. All right, you can see that it's actually very complicated, but that the probability of observing an electron neutrino can change rapidly and be very dependent on the neutrino energy as well. So um, there have been a number of uh, additional experiments that confirm neutrino oscillations. One of them involves antineutrinos from a reactor. The best data come from uh, actually building a detector in the center of an array of nuclear power plants in Japan called Camland, the experiment. And, um, and then here's a particular model here shown in the dotted line that runs through their data point uh, that the neutrinos observed are significantly less than those expected to have been produced by the reactors. There's accelerator searches that actually look for the muon electron changing into the electron neutrino. These Muon neutrinos are produced in accelerators. And um, this, there's a, an allowed region here. And there's the delta m squared. And one of the interesting conundrums is that if we can see the muon neutrino changing into the electron neutrino, but the change of the electron neutrino into neutrino x, such as is shown here, has a very different delta m squared. So these aren't quite consistent. And so our understanding of neutrinos has changed radically. It's the neutrinos that are different than we thought, not the standard solar model, not Ray Davis's experiment. It's the neutrinos. And so this standard picture of all of subatomic physics shown here, in which the neutrinos uh, play a very prominent role, uh, actually really needs to be changed. We don't know exactly how yet. The standard solar model works exceedingly well, and our understanding of the sun is essential to all of studies of astrophysics of stars, stellar evolution, from star formation all the way to supernovae. So we have a lot more confidence in that. The boron-8 neutrino flux, the highest part of the spectrum, is consistent with the standard solar model. Uh, neutrinos oscillate. Antineutrinos produced in reactors oscillate also. And neutrinos produced in uh, cosmic rays or in accelerator experiments also oscillate into something we're not sure what. So we don't know that these are the same. And most impressive to me, in a way, is that they really got it right. People doubted them, doubted them, doubted them again, but they stuck to it, and they were right. But there's really a lot left to do, and so let me just uh, leave this up here. Uh, to say what's next, what's next is we really have to fill in a lot of the pieces. What really is delta m squared? What about, I talked about the two-state system, but there's a third neutrino which much, must mix in. How does it do it? Neutrino spectroscopy, neutrino physics from the sun will go on, as well as cosmic neutrino detectors. These are really kind of interesting. Amanda has drilled a bunch of holes in the, in the ice, cores in the ice in Antarctica. And so instead of a big tank of water, they're using the Antarctic ice sheet as their Cherenkov detector and uh, drop the phototubes down there. And uh, this one, Antares, is uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, which is uh, warmer. And, but the physicists are just as avid for each of them. <laughs> and finally, the particle physics of neutrino mixing uh, needs to be incorporated into the standard model. So thanks. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated.